Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Oriel Fel Feldman Hall. She is the Alfred Manning Associate Professor of Cognitive Linguistic and Psychological Sciences at Brown University. Her research seeks to disentangle the cognitive and neural processes behind the complex choices that form the basis of human social behavior. She aims to understand how the brain detects, values, and assesses conflicting reward and punishment contingencies during moral dilemmas, and to examine the role of emotion and its operational power in shaping these social interactions. And today we're going to focus mostly on, I guess we could call it the social neuroscience of morality. So Dr. Feldman Hall, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So let me ask you first, because morality is a topic uh, addressed by many different scientific disciplines and also philosophy, and I've talked about it on the show with everyone from, philosoph from moral philosophers to evolutionary psychologists, economists even. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you understand morality and approach it from the perspective of social neuroscience. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I think that as a social neuroscientist, what my job is, is to understand how people make moral decisions. Mm -hmm. um, that is in a descriptive sense. Um, so I'm looking to understand the why and the how of you know, the moral decision making landscape without applying any judgment whatsoever onto whether that's right or wrong. So a lot of philosophers, um, you know, I teach a, a class called the moral brain, and we start off the class by looking at um, some of the philosophers who are really important in creating the foundation for moral decision making. And in many of those philosophical traditions, there, these philosophers are looking to describe what is right about our moral actions or our moral judgments. Um, and that's, you know, normative. But as a scientist, we don't really think that way, or I think we're not supposed to think that way. That's my personal take. I'm agnostic as to whether there's a right and a wrong and the types of decisions that we're looking at. What I'm more interested in is understanding what is the fingerprint of human behavior, like what are people doing and why are people doing that? What are the mechanisms and the processes that are happening in the brain that give rise to these behavioral fingerprints that we see in the moral space? Mm -hmm. And do, do you look at morality, uh, the way you look at morality, is there a difference between it and altruism because and hopefully we will have time to get into questions like for example uh, something that people discuss a lot is if we really are moral for altruistic reasons or uh, reasons that are other oriented let's say or for selfish egotistical reasons but uh, is there a difference between morality and altruism yeah, so that's a great question. So I think of morality as this big penumbra term that encompasses um, lots of different actions, like choosing to help someone, like altruism, trusting another person or being trustworthy, uh, reciprocation, cooperation, all of these types of terms fit under the hood of what I consider morality. Altruism is just one particular class of behaviors that is moral. Mm -hmm. So, for example, from the perspective of social neuroscience, and I'm asking you this because there are people like moral psychologists who try to come up with what would be some of the psychological ingredients of morality, and they talk about different sorts of behaviors and, for example, moral foundations. Is that also the, the do you approach morality from the perspective of social neuroscience with uh, an equivalent framework in mind that is trying to find out the sort of psychological or behavioral ingredients behind it or not? Yeah, um, that's interesting. So I would have, if, if we you had asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have answered yes. I And I would have said, you know, some of those ingredients 
are really important for understanding our moral calculus. So things like harm to others, mm -hmm. um, maybe fairness too, are part and parcel of the moral decision-making calculus. But I would say that since you're asking me the question now, that those ingredients I think are kind of less important than the processes themselves. So I don't feel that there's as much utility in mapping the ingredients of the moral calculus, harm, fairness, purity, loyalty, like a lot of foundational, moral foundation work has done. What I'm more interested in doing is understanding the operations that are the computations that happen about the moral space, regardless if they include harm or fairness or purity or whatnot. Um, and so my work in the last decade has sort of taken a different turn away from um, looking at just harm, harm to others or, you know, fairness between self and other and looking at more of the process level or the systems level of, of the question. And so when it comes to moral decision making, what are the main or at least the cognitive tools that we know of that are part of that toolkit, I guess? Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a this is a great question because I think one easy response would be to say any cognitive tools that you have in any other part of your life can also be used for moral decision making. I'm not a specialist um, that, you know, moral decision making or moral learning in particular recruits a special type of cognitive toolkit. Um, that being said, there's certainly some cognitive tools get more airtime um, when we're talking about moral dilemmas or moral decision making than others. Um, so for example, I think that emotions um, is one, super relevant uh, process that guides the types of moral decisions we make. But of course, there's other things like heuristics, um, such as the familiarity or similarity to things that you might already know, or ease of effort. You don't have to have too much effort to partake in a moral decision if it's too difficult. Those types of um, cognitive tools certainly come to bear on the types of moral decisions we make. Although I would probably argue that emotion is probably one of the most central um, tools that we use um, when it comes to moral decision making. And how do you understand emotion from the perspective of neuroscience? Because, of course, unfortunately, we have a sort of Western intellectual tradition of pitting, for example, emotion against reason, for example, and yeah. sometimes saying that if emotion plays a role in choice or decision making, it usually leads us astray in, in some way. But uh, how do you think about emotions from that perspective? Okay, so I have to, let's debunk that completely. I think that emotion, first of all, emotion should not ever be pitted against reason. I think that's a false dichotomy and it's certainly not a seesaw where you have emotions up, you have reason that's down or vice versa. Um, that's number one. I think that the the system of how emotion and reason interact with each other is very multifaceted and multilayered, and it can't be distilled to down to that two systems um, framework. The second is, I also don't buy the 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 argument, the approach, the theory that emotions are you know, taking us off course from what we should be doing and leading us to be optimality, sort of like this rationally optimal um, agent. Rather, emotions are really useful for cueing us in and signaling, signaling to us what types of decisions are good, adaptive, um, helpful for ourselves, helpful for our communities, helpful to... Um, you know, saving somebody else, those emotions are really part and parcel of tailoring our decisions to make more, I would say in some cases, moral decisions, to make the most moral decisions. So um, in fact, it's really the opposite that emotions rather than leading us astray are instrumental in keeping us um, on these like important paths towards making adaptive decisions. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but if I interpret the evidence correctly when it comes to the role that emotions play in decision making, people can't really make decisions if they 
wouldn't have emotions. Like, for example, Antonio Damasio, for example, talks about cases of people who have suffered brain lesions that basically disconnect the limbic system from the frontal, their frontal cortices, and they can't really make proper decisions. Right. Yeah, so those individuals certainly do make decisions, but they're often decisions that are not aligned with the, let's say, the greater good of humanity. So they might make decisions that are more selfish, that help mm -hmm. um, themselves feel good in the moment, but um, compromise their relationship with somebody else. They can be impulsive, for example, rather than mm -hmm thinking long term about, you know, if I do something right now, that would compromise my relationship with this individual and not help foster it through time. Um, so yeah, those individuals are certainly making decisions They're just usually not making decisions that um, are well suited within the greater ecosystem of engaging with other people in a pro social way, mm -hmm. to create a very broad rough stroke um, account. Right. And what do we know about the neurocircuitry that plays a role in moral decision making? Are there, for example, particular areas of the brain that, I mean, of course, they might not be exclusive to moral decision making right. or specialized in it, but participate in moral decision making? Yes. So... There's a number of different regions that time and time again over the last two decades have come up in the neuroscience of moral decision making. So um, they basically boil down to regions of the prefrontal cortex, which are right here, um, you know, right behind my forehead. Um, there's an area that sort of sits right behind where your ears are on both sides called the temporal parietal junction. Um, that area in particular is believed to be useful for thinking about what other people think about, so perspective taking. Um, we also have uh, the anterior insula, which is also bilaterally situated, which is you know along here, right in front of the ears. Um, that basically comes up in almost every social cognition study that you've ever seen. It's like a, a, a marker of, are you alive in some ways, but that's also critical, <laughs> critical for moral decision-making. Um, and then you have regions that are um, not as cortical. So you have, for example, the subgenual ACC, which uh, sits sort of in the middle. You have the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, you have the ventral striatum and the cauda and the putamen, made up of the cauda and putamen, which is uh, important for learning and value based decision making. Um, and so all of these regions together um show up routinely when we're making moral decisions so if you think about and excuse me the amygdala as well and the amygdala is of course canonically associated with fear with threat with emotions um and so if you take a bird's eye view of what these areas do in in um their collective what we see is that regions involved in um, emotions, thinking about other people, valuation, so the striatum and areas of the prefrontal cortex are critical for moral decision making. Um, and that's sort of the, the quick and the dirty of what parts of the brain are involved uh, when we make these types of choices. Mm -hmm. But when talking about these different regions of the brain, is it that any one of them is specialized in moral decision making? I mean, I'm asking you that question because when it comes to discussions surrounding neuroscience, many times um, the people bring to the table the discussion about modularity of the mind and if we have different specialized modules in the brain dedicated to different specific functions and all of that. And we might get into that bigger discussion later on in the interview, but uh, is that the case for moral decision making or not? Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess this is more of a question of at what level are we curious to have an explanation? What At what level do we want an explanation? So 
You know, mm-hmm. do I think that the amygdala is unique to moral decision making? Is it? No. I mean, there's we, there's so much data that suggests that's not the case. That's not the case for the TPJ or the prefrontal cortex. So any region of those that I just mentioned are also active when you're making decisions about which popsicle to eat, the strawberry mm-hmm. or the mango, or, you know, how do I want to gamble in this particular task? Or, you know, am I going to respond to the threat of an electric shock? All of those regions show up in these other types of cases that don't have moral underpinnings, that don't have moral implications. So no, there's no part of the brain that I would make an argument or have ever seen evidence for that is unique to moral decision making. Now, that being said, for the first 10 years of imaging work, if not more, were spent in a, a race or a goal in service of um, showing where in the brain something happens. So for example, fear happens with the amygdala. Theory of mind happens with the temporal parietal junction. And in the last you know, decade or so, there's been a little bit of a tide turn, which talks about representation. So it's not just about where in the brain something is happening, but what is the nature of representation in those regions of the brain? So for example, in the amygdala, you can have um, a pattern of activity that is involved in threat. And then you can have a different uh, pattern of activity. We're talking about neural patterns of activity that encode for something else, like a different type of emotion. And the work that's predominantly happening now and also in moral decision-making is understanding what the representational content um, of particular regions like the amygdala in service of these types of moral decisions or the types of emotions and so forth. Um, And so to, to make a more nuanced argument here, I would say that you can have activation in one region subserve both social or moral decision making and non moral decision making, um, and that one region can you know do play both parts. But at the level of representation or computations, things might look different. Um, let's say within the amygdala when you're making a moral decision than when you're deciding whether to gamble between you know two card decks or whatever. Um, and so that's where you know a lot of the work is focusing now and really understanding what those two different types of representations look like. Mm-hmm. So this is a question that I've sort of alluded to in the beginning of our interview, but can social neuroscience help us answer a very old question in moral philosophy? That is, uh, what helps, what drives us to help uh, others? Is it um, something like empathic other-oriented concern, or is it something more egotistical self-centered like the feeling feeling the need to reduce our own distress is that something that neuroscience can answer or help us answer or not yeah i think it certainly can help answer that question and i would also hedge here and say that it's not going to be one of those things Mm. that any one particular answer will soak up a certain amount of variance in explaining like why we help other people so for example part of our motivation might be to reduce our own distress because we feel um, discomfort because we Mm. want to feel good and it helps us feel good Um, another um, part of the reason we help someone else is because we're other oriented. We have this empathic response and it helps orient us to helping other people. And both of those things can be true at once. Um, And together or in concert with other variables as well, it can help motivate us for helping other people. And I actually would argue, so, you know, one of the things that you brought up in the beginning um, of the interview is, you know, are we altruistic or altruistic sake like do we have Mm -hmm. this like pure altruism and i would say that why does it matter if we do so you know maybe this is more of a philosophical question but does it matter that we have an altruistic response that is purely altruistic for altruistic sake that's devoid of any selfishness why does that matter if at the end of the day the behavior promotes helping other people, why couldn't we get a little bit of a hedonic boost, which would be, let's say, selfish in helping someone else? Why does that make it, why does that make 
you know, the altruistic response no longer um, truly altruistic in a sense. So I never really quite understood that argument um, that I've heard, um, you know, some individuals make, particularly, let's say, philosophers, um, because at the end of the day, we still are helping other people, regardless of whether we have a little selfishness in doing it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but you know that I've talked with many philosophers on the show, and sometimes people get into very heated discussions because uh, apparently some people think that intentions matter a lot <laughs> and not just the outcomes. So I, I I agree that intentions do matter, but if if we are helping other people and it feels good in the process, that shouldn't. Um, you know, take away from the fact that we are helping other people. I think intentions do matter. And in fact, if you look at a lot of our legal code, our intentions for whether, let's say, we commit a crime or what happens are taken into account when discussing what the punishment may or may not be. So intentions mm -hmm. certainly are important and they can give a larger picture and understanding for how we move about the world, but they shouldn't negate all the benefits that come from being altruistic just because part of our altruistic response is something that helps ourselves feel good. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, what sort of role does learning or might learning play in shaping our moral values? Because we've been talking a lot about the neuroscience, about the brain and um, I think also mentioning a little bit the biology behind all of this, but what about learning? Does it play an important role here or not? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I would argue that learning, you could look at learning in two different ways. One way you could look at um, learning from other people. So we can observe how other people move about the world, you know, to take a really classic example, you don't need to put your hand on a hot stove to know that you're gonna get burnt. You can watch someone else do it or even get close to doing it to know that I shouldn't do that myself. So you have a whole um, host of observational learning. A lot of that research um, has happened in the developmental space. So, you know, children observing adults um, doing certain things and understanding how um, we come to like understand social norms or what's morally appropriate or what's not. And then there's another type of learning and that is experiencing the world for ourselves. So, you know, to take that example again is to put the, my hand on the hot um, on the hot stove and realize that it's hot and therefore never will do it again. When it comes to moral phenomenon, you know, something that, you know, that our lab looks at a lot is decisions to trust or to cooperate. So, you know, I might learn that someone is somewhat trustworthy um, and that I have to have multiple other, other iterations with them in different contexts to build out a more robust representation of that this person is by and large trustworthy, regardless of what the context is, whereas someone else is trustworthy in one case and is untrustworthy in a different case. And then a third person, let's say, is never trustworthy. Um, and I would need to have all those experiences and pull them together, integrate those experiences to build up that representation. And so for the most part, those two different ways of thinking about learning have subsumed totally different fields um, within the social cognition um, research. There's not as much work that has been done in learning um, directly from experiences, like the stuff that a lot of my lab is doing. Um, and a lot more of the work is in an observational sense. Um, but what we try to do is we try to set up situations let's say moral dilemmas where you pit two different options, you know, one that has self-benefit, let's say money. So there could be like a lot of money on the line versus harm to another person, let's say applying electric shocks to them. And then you have to, as the participant, as a subject in the, in the paradigm, figure out what you value more. Do you value the money that I'm gonna take? But if I take the money, the electric shock is gonna be applied to this other person. And we watch how people, you know, sort of struggle through this moral dilemma uh, to make a decision and how repeated instances and experiences with, let's say, watching someone else be harmed changes what my calculus is and what I value in that uh, decision framework. Mm 
And uh, through social neuroscience, can we also get a better understanding of how social norms evolve? Can it tell us anything about that or not? Yeah, so that's a, that's actually a pretty hard question because social norms develop over a time scale that the lab can't really mm -hmm. um, measure. So right. um, it makes for a really challenging, albeit interesting space. And there's some um, creative work that is trying to get around this. So like you can create social norms um, in fake worlds, like on planets that don't exist amongst these little monsters and see how quickly people can pick them up. Um, there's definitely some creative ways about thinking uh, uh, through this. Um, but, you know, for the most part, there's, you know, these what I would call like universal social norms, which is mostly like don't harm other people. But then there's also all these caveats, unless you're in war, like you can make a caveat for every social and, you know, moralistic um, norm that there is. Um, so a number of these norms exist out in the world and are pretty strongly entrenched in our cultures. And so um, we can play with that information, those what we call priors about what I think the way the world works. And to understand that if you violate a social norm, what happens in a person's mind or in their brain when a social norm like that is violated? How do people respond? How do people recover um, in a relationship with one another? You know, and like, is, does it become tit for tat, reciprocal and so forth? Um, so there's an interest, there's some interesting work that is happening in social norms, even though it's hard to study. Mm -hmm. And do we know if there's any particular social instruments, like, for example, sometimes people talk about fairness, altruism, trust, and so on, that underpin compliance to these norms? Do we know how and why people comply to them? Yeah. Um, you know, we've made the case in the past that you know, reciprocity is one of these guiding instruments um, in which people um, adhere to and continue to adhere to social norms. Um, the idea that, you know, if I behave a certain way, that that should be reciprocal in action. And so, you know, one of the, the goals that we certainly come into the moral landscape with, and I think a lot of scientists do as well, is to explain behavior in the most parsimonious way. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually one of the reasons that I've moved away from sort of detailing, you know, is it harm? Is it fairness? Is it purity? Is it authority? And so forth, because you could essentially create a whole, you know, building block system um, for morality broken into tiny, tiny little bits. But if you can find, you know, one thing, like let's say reciprocity, then reciprocity works on fairness. It works on harm. It works on purity. It works on authoritarianism and so on and so forth um, in guiding people's behavior as they engage with one another. Um, so it's one positive mechanism, although I'm sure that many other people would disagree or argue for different ones. Um, but yeah. So uh, we've already alluded to this previously, but people, of course, many times experience competing moral motivations. Uh, do we know how they learn to weigh these different competing moral motivations when they experience them? Um, yeah, so I guess this comes back to you know, how do we take, let's say, direct experiences or observational experiences and how mm -hmm. do they get weighed up um, in the mind or in the brain when making these decisions? So um, I can use uh, some current work, it's unpublished, um, that's happening in my lab right now that um, helps figure out it's a mechanism by which people make decisions like this. So mm -hmm. uh, this is work done by Amrita Lamba. She's one of my graduate students. And in particular, this work is seeking to figure out when we engage with other people, who do we credit um, 
like a particular action or outcome to, given that we're interacting with multiple different people in the world. So for example, mm -hmm. let's say you tell a secret um, to three different people, and then you find out that that secret gets back to the person that you're chatting that it's about, you know, who, which one of the three individuals that you told is the source of, of, of this problem that it got back to. Um, and this is a really important thing to figure out in the social world, because you basically want to credit positive outcomes to good actors and negative outcomes to bad actors so that you can re-engage with good actors and steer clear of bad actors. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that Amrita has found in her work is that the prefrontal cortex essentially takes representations. This is like these neural patterns that I was talking about earlier uh, for a good outcome. And when you have that neural representation in your mind, in your brain, and you come a, um, across a similar situation again, you basically do a matching function. And you take those neural representations from the past in a certain, that had a certain good or bad outcome, and you match it to what is in front of you right now. And if there's a good match, you say, okay, I can assign that credit that this is a good actor or this is a bad actor. And this is all happening in uh, regions of the prefrontal cortex. And this provides a really good mechanism for understanding how we figure out to hang out with good people and you know steer clear of bad people is by taking these previous experiences that we have like this neural code for being presented like in the moment with these two options where we have like a representation neural code and then doing a matching function to say, okay, actually I'm gonna hang out with this person and then ignore that person. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also study uncertainty in social context. So yeah. what does that mean? Uh, what strategies do people adopt to reduce it? And does it also apply to moral decision making or not? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uncertainty in the social world. So I, I you know, like to think about it like there's uncertainty in, in every single thing that we do in the world. Like if I'm waiting in you know New York City for the train, I'm not sure when the train is going to come. It might come in two minutes. It might come in 10 minutes. Um, although I can be pretty certain that it's going to come right like, at a, you know, within the next 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how bad uh, the train delays are. In the social world, if I, let's just take, you know, this conversation that we're having here, I have some cues about um, our particular interaction. So if I say something and you nod your head or you smile, I know that you're in agreement with what I'm saying, but if you were to shake your head or grimace or give me some sort of negative cue, I would take it as like, oh, I'm you know saying the wrong thing or maybe I should steer clear of something else. But if you gave me a completely neutral face that, I would take that as something super ambiguous. Um, am I talking too much? Am I getting into too much detail? Am I staying too high level? And so there's a lot of uncertainty in all of our social interactions. What are you going to ask me next? Am I going to be prepared to answer that question? And so the type of uncertainties that abound in this social space when two people are engaging are a lot more high dimensional and there's a lot more of them than the types of uncertainties that we engage in <laughs> in the non-social space for example you know waiting for the train um uh to come and take you home from work or whatever it might be and so that makes for a much harder problem for mm -hmm. us to solve like we have to figure out you know what are you thinking ricardo what are you going to ask me next what am i going to then do in response and i have to iterate over these uncertainties um uh, which pro which is much more challenging, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so those are the types of social uncertainties that happen and how they differ from non-social uncertainties. Now, the tools that we have, again, I would say are very similar in both cases, um, but they might be co-opted in different ways. So, for example, you know, a tried and true uh, a cognitive tool is to think about is to do what is called like inferential processing or thinking about what you're thinking so that I can know what I'm going to do so that I can think about what you would do next. And so I can have this like recursive uh, thinking about what you're thinking about to help me figure out what's the best next adaptive behavior. Um, that Those are the types of tools that we most readily use when we're trying to resolve these social uncertainties that we encounter engaging with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, when it comes to our moral behavior, there's sometimes a disconnect between what people 
say and what they think when it comes to their moral values and how they behave, in fact. So is that something that social neuroscience can also help us understand or not? I would argue absolutely. So <laughs> um, my very first study that I ever ran uh, was the my work for my PhD, my first uh, work for my PhD. Uh, I would argue sought to look at this low hanging fruit between, you know, what we do when we're thinking about moral actions, what we think we're going to do, and then what are the actions that we actually do. So in this set of studies, um, we incentivize people to keep money at the expense of harming other people. And so we just simply, at, at that time, it was uh, 2008 when I started my PhD, um, and Josh Green, who was at Harvard, had this beautiful and, um, you know, very earth shattering for the moral domain paper where he took like philosopher esque dilemmas like the trolley dilemma, which I think like so many people are know about now, but essentially pit, you know, do you run over five workers on the track or do you reroute the track to, to only hit one person and kill that one individual? And what do you do? Um, and so, you know, that type of moral dilemma, there is like a bad outcome in either way. Number one, number two, it doesn't pull on the tensions that, are relevant to me in the sense that there's my benefits not on the line there. It's about five and one other individual. Um, it's also, they're exotic, they're weird, right? Like when's a case that we're gonna um, come up with, you know, being presented with, you know, five people in one and which one do we do? But, you know, the, the, the moral dilemmas that are much more part and parcel of our everyday lives do have a self component. So like, you know, expending my own self benefit for somebody else, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, embezzling from a company or stealing from a bodega or, you know, cheating on your spouse. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can um, operationalize this out in the real world. So we wanted to look at that in the lab and we wanted to see how different, like we have this idea that of course people, you know, have like a hypothetical sense of moral self. I'll, you know, can say and do anything as long as I don't have to do it. And then you have like a historical record that, you know, humanity has been immoral since the dawn of time. Um, so which one is it? Like, let's, 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 let's take this to the lab and actually put some numbers to it. So that's what we did. And um, we found that um, individuals um, will say that they're much more moral um, when it's hypothetical, they'll say like, you know, I even had when we ask people, you know, when you give you, you know, 200 bucks, will you apply electric shocks to somebody else for this $200? You know, I had even some individuals say that's so insulting. They would even ask me that question. I would never do it. I'm not even going to answer the question. And they would like throw their arms up. But most of the people would say, you know, I would never do that. I can't believe you're asking. But then we brought in, you know, 150 people to the lab and we said, okay, let's do this for real. Here's the money shock another person. And then of that 150, only one person gave up the money. So you have this big discrepancy between what people said they were going to do or thought they were going to do and what they actually did when it came down to, you know, cold, hard cash on the table. Mm -hmm. But do you think, uh, I mean, how should we interpret that kind of thing? Should, do you think we should call it uh, moral hypocrisy or not? Or is it just I don't know, normal human behavior to be sort of disconnected from uh, what motivates you and stuff like that. I mean, basically to not have access to what really drives your behavior, let's say, a conscious access. Yeah, oh, that's a good question. So I think it's both. I think it's both moral hypocrisy and I think we don't have access to... Um, what it feels like to make a moral decision in the moment. And so, you know, part of that, the follow-up work that we did was showing that if you simulate enough of the moral dilemma so that people can feel what the tensions are, the decision can still be hypothetical. You still don't have to actually do the shocks or get the money, but you can essentially align people's behavior with what they do in the reality by showing them everything else about what the moral dilemma is like, it, letting them feel the shock, letting them meet the other person that they're going to apply the shock, placing the money on the table, even if they're not going to get it, you simulate all this other stuff for them so that they don't have to do it in their mind. And you essentially can align people's behavior um, with what they do in reality. So the whole simulation um, thing, the, the process is really important. So, 
if you want people to not be uh, hypocritical, if you want people to be able to um, understand and be aligned with what motivates them to do certain behaviors, then you have to create situations that are really rich in context within the environment that don't necessitate that they have to simulate what all those tensions are like. Once you do that, then you can know that those behaviors would look like reality. Mm -hmm. So I have two or three more general questions about social neuroscience and perhaps one of them applied specifically to the realm of morality or ethics. So when it comes uh, in terms of social neuroscience specifically, because it sort of marries social psychology or some other social sciences to neuroscience. And uh, of course, I'm going to ask you a question about nature versus nurture here, but I'm not implying at all that all neuroscientists or all neuroscience falls on the, on the nature camp necessarily, but sometimes it does. So uh, do you think that it can shed new light on that kind of debate between nature and nurture? And do you think that debate, knowing what we know nowadays through the different social sciences, neuroscience, biology, and all of that still makes sense? Or is it better to think about it in terms of uh, like some people put it, nature via nurture or the opposite, depending on whichever way you prefer to frame mm -hmm. it. Um, so I would argue that the most useful thing about that debate, so no one's going to argue that it's all nature or that it's all uh, nurture. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be foolhardy. But I think the the more useful way to frame that debate is how much and under what conditions does nature and nurture become the front runner? And the good thing about neuroscience, or social neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience is that we can quantify and measure, um, you know, aspects of the nature versus the nurture debate and put them up side by side and see, you know, which measurements or, you know, which one is coming out ahead of the game. I think that's where the neuroscientist toolkit becomes really useful is in the quantification about debates like that, less so about whether, I mean, sure, it might be nurture via nature or nature via nurture, depending on you know how you look at it, but it could also uh, depend on the person, number one, so like individual differences might matter. Also what the context is, in some cases, one might flip what the equation is onto the other, depending if the context is, let's say, massively uncertain or not. Um, and so more to the point is just that we have the tools to make the whole conversation about be more precise in its characterization and really measure things out. Mm -hmm. But I mean, of course, looking at the interaction is very important, but perhaps uh, assuming a position like all being uh, reducible to nature or nurture, perhaps with what we know nowadays is no longer an interesting position to have, right? I would argue that's correct. I don't think it's that, I I, I think that's not going to help. Answering that type of question won't really help mm -hmm. us move the needle in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you look uh, at how social neuroscience is positioned, positioned in relation to the social sciences and neuroscience itself? Do you think that it can help establish some sort of bridge between them or not? Yeah. Um, so uh, there's definitely in, in my field of psychology and neuroscience more broadly, there is um, a certain approach that people take where you can be trained as a cognitive neuroscientist or a social psychologist or cognitive scientists. And there's these different traditions of like who you trained with, where you did, and you know, you know, what methods you use that can define, that can be very career defining. I personally think that those, um, <clears throat> uh, I hope I'm not getting myself into trouble here, but I, I don't think that those either lineages or um, areas 
where you can um, carve out, you know, cognitive neuros, cognitive neuroscience, social psychology, behavioral economics, is that meaningful? What's more interesting is where those particular, let's say, fields or subfields start to talk to each other or where work is done that intersects those fields together. Um, you know, someone once said to me, like, there's no, you know, interesting research. It's just a regurgitation of what's already been done. Um, and I think that is true to some degree um, until we get to the fringes of fields. And when we look at the fringes of fields and how, you know, two fields might talk to each other or intersect with one another, new discoveries, new ways of thinking about old problems can be really useful for helping us understand how the mind works. Mm -hmm. So one last question focused on the morality side of things. So uh, we've been talking throughout the interview about how social neuroscience can answer or at least inform some of uh, some of the philosophical debates surrounding morality and ethics do you think that it is also equipped to deal with questions uh, i mean at the beginning for example you said that social neuroscience and perhaps you would agree that science in general cannot really tell us, uh, tell us what is right and wrong but um, just inform us about how people make moral decisions, how people think morally and all of that. But uh, still, uh, do you think that it can participate in the debate surrounding, for example, moral realism and anti-realism? Like, for example, are there really objective moral values to be found out there? or not at all, and it is just completely explained away by science, being it neuroscience, psychology, biology, or whatever. Because I'm asking you that because there are people who, in fact, resort to science to say that, I mean, basically, we shouldn't talk about objective moral values at all, that the only game to play is moral anti-realism because science explains all of that debate away let's say or uh, what do you think about it so is the question that you're asking is are there objective moral truths in the world uh yeah and if science <laughs> social neuroscience particularly has something to say about that or not yeah um, or, or if no. it's just a pure philosophical question. So. I don't think that there are objective moral truths in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And I would argue that there's no objective truths in science either. So, like, yeah. I mean, it's a kind of a hard question to answer because on the one hand, the pursuit of what we're doing is to get at some truth about the way, mm -hmm. you know, morality works, right? We right. want to find the truth. But I think that, you know, first of all, the scientific process is flawed in the sense that there is no, our measurement tools are not perfect instruments. Like we we can capture only as much as our instruments allow us to capture and they don't capture everything. Um, and so we might see what we, we might look at something and see it as a version of truth without really understanding the full picture and therefore it not being truth. And so if we were to come out on record and say, well, this is the truth of the way the world works, you know, if we waited five to 10 years or 15 years, we find out that that is in fact not true. Um, and so there's an evolution to what we're doing in a process that continues to try to refine what we see as, you know, the objective insert moral uh, truth. Um, but I would argue that as I see the world now, that there's not necessarily an objective moral truth because A, we can't get there with the tools that we have and B, I'm not sure it exists in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. So um, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure, they can uh, go to my lab website, which is Feldman Hall lab.com where we have all of our research um and any news about what's happening in our lab and all our publications which are not behind a paywall if they want to read about them they can find there too 
Okay, great. I will be leaving links to that in the description box of this interview. And Dr. Feldman Hall, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's and been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been waiting since 2019, just for people to know. So, <laughs> Well, thank you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzka and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegar, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Jorge Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nyars, T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Simon Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morton Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Giorgio Stéphanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Ugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis, and Al Nick Ortiz. And to my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.